you're worthy, Lord. My hallelujah belongs. My hallelujah belongs to you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate our God on tonight. He's worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the praise. He's our king. He's our master. He's our Lord. He's our savior. He's the God almighty. Hallelujah. He's the lover of our souls. Hallelujah. He's our way maker. He's our keeper. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. Hallelujah. 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 deserving of all honor, all glory, all praise, God. You're deserving of all that and so much more because you are God, you are a maker, you are a creator. It's in you that we live and move and have our being. Lord, without you, we wouldn't even be in this place on today. It's because of you that we have the breath of life. It's because of you, Lord God, that we made our way here safely on tonight. It's because of you, Lord God, because of your watching over us, your keeping us, and Lord, you're even giving us a mind to come out to the house of the Lord to hear what you have on to say on tonight. Father God, have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, teach us on tonight. Teach us the ways of God. Cleanse us, O oh God. Purify our hearts, O oh God. We want to walk worthy of the calling that you've called us to. Let us truly show our appreciation, show our hallelujahs by how we live, what we say, what we do, Lord God. We want to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, Lord God. We don't want to be pretenders. We want to be praisers. We want to be worshipers, oh God. Teach us on tonight that we will be everything that you called us to be in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. 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 And shout unto the Lord one more time on three. Hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. If you ever want to get out of a sad place where you feel like you're in a funk, all you got to do is start praising the Lord. It will change your environment because the Lord God inhabits, he lives in, he rests in, he loves to stay in the praises of his people. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, children. 
Thank you for being here on tonight. At this time, you're dismissed to go and be with your teachers. Come on, let's give all of our essential workers a hand of praise, our teachers, our ushers, security, everybody that's here serving God's people. Do we have any first-time visitors on tonight? Any first-time visitors? No? Well, welcome back. Love first. Oh, I see one. Who? Yes? I'm not going to ask you to say anything. I just want to say welcome on behalf of Pastor Joe Mo, Pastor Charmaine. Thank you for being here. We know God has something special, a special word for you to meet you at the place where you are in life. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. And now we're going to say our vision, the vision that God has given our pastor. We recite this knowing where God has taken him and given him a vision and that we align with the vision. Hallelujah. You'll see it on the screen. I ask that you say it with me to equip people with the knowledge of God's word, to empower to seek God's face in daily prayer, to encounter and be filled with the Holy Spirit, to evangelize our community, our country, and our world, to embrace every person in godly love, for God is love for each one to reach one. Y'all know my next question. Did y'all reach one today? I heard somebody. Did you reach one today with your smile, with your kindness? When they were ugly or gave you the stank face that you still smile at them and be kind and love on them and made a decision to pray for them. Hallelujah. That's how we reach people. Jesus wants us to let our light so shine that people see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Now we're going to see our confession of faith in the Word of God because it's the Word of God that's alive and active and endures forever and changes our lives. If you have your Bibles, sir, security, will you, get, will you hand me my phone? I'm not going to get caught this time without mine. So if you have uh, whatever technology or your Bible, Bible, hard book Bible, if you just raise that in the air and make this confession and let not it, it just not be words, but let it resonate in your heart. Say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I believe I believe my life will never, ever be the same after hearing and doing the living Word of God. Now give God praise for change on tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've been enjoying 2 Samuel, and I know many of you have as well. We're going to continue in that same book. Tonight we'll be looking at uh, the 16th chapter, but before we dive into it, just a quick backdrop of what uh, Pastor Lee was talking about last, uh, last week as far as some events leading up to what we'll talk about tonight. We know that there have been some things that happened in David's family, and it was as a result of uh, his sinful act with uh, Bathsheba and killing her husband and taking Bathsheba as his wife. And a lot of things happened in his family uh, that caused some heartburn with his children. Um, and then some things happened with one of his daughter. One of his sons actually raped his daughter. And the brother of that sister, his name was Absalom, and Absalom was enraged because nothing really happened to the brother. Unfortunately, David did not do anything. He was sorrowful that it happened, but he did not really punish his son. And Absalom, being so angry, he killed his brother. And then he went away. For a time, and then he eventually came back. But when he came back, he came back with dishonest, dishonesty and still some unforgiveness in his heart. And he had plans and he was plotting to uproot his father from King David from his position so he can 
assume that position. And we saw last week how he was gaining popularity with the people of Israel, things that he would do and things that he would say. And after a few years, he decided to have a coup and throw, overthrow his father. And David is now on the run. He's in shock probably disbelief. This was not something he had expected to happen in his life, that his son would come against him in this way. Now he's fearful for his, for his life, for the rest of his family's life, for his servant's life. He's even unsure where he's going. When he leaves, he even leaves barefoot. That's how quickly he left with his head covered. Not just him, but his family and his uh, friends, as well as some of his servants. He was shocked, as I said, at his son's actions, shocked that even his counselor, who he depended on, would betray him and side with his son. He was also probably shocked of Israel's willingness to back him up and what he was doing. So he's in a very uncomfortable place. And we're going to see as we look at this chapter 16, the weight that's really upon David and how this affects his life, as well as we'll see the continued ill will actions that his son Absalom takes against him. And Holy Spirit is going to teach us tonight a lot of different things, life-giving truths concerning our decision-making, concerning, our for, concerning friendships, and concerning forgiveness. So let's, let's jump right in. Verse 1 through 2 reads, When David had passed a little beyond the summit, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of donkeys saddled, bearing 200 loaves of bread, 100 bunches of raisins, 100 of summer fruits and skin, 100 of summer fruits and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why have you brought these? Ziba answered, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine for those who faint in the wilderness to drink. Now, recall, now, Ziba was, a, was the one who, when David asked, is there anybody in the house of Saul that I can do good to? And he told him, yes. It was Jonathan's son, David's best friend. His name was Mephibosheth. And David was very kind to him. When he found him, he had restored everything, even the property that belonged to Saul. He gave it to him. And not only that, he invited him to eat at his table every day. But it seems like Ziba just comes out of nowhere, meeting Saul with all these the food and the wine. And David has a question, which we see in the next few verses, three through four, it reads, and the king said, and where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, behold, he, re he remains in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel will give me back the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, behold, all that belonged to Mephibosheth is now yours. And Ziba said, I pay homage. He was grateful, said he was grateful. He said, let me ever find favor in your sight, my lord, the king. Now, wow. Now, I just, we just talked about how David restored everything to Mephibosheth, right? But then when he hears this news from Ziba, he's kind of taken back by what he's telling him. Because Ziba says that Mephibosheth, he's staying in Jerusalem because he thinks today the Israelites will restore to me my grandfather's kingdom. In other words, I'm looking to, be, to take the rightful place that I should have. But David, it seemed like that, that seemed really strange for him to say something like that because Mephibosheth was crippled. And Mephibosheth was dependent on Ziba very much. But David, with everything that's going on with him, he doesn't even question Ziba. Because after all, his son has betrayed him, right? 
not only his son, but the one he depended on for counsel has betrayed him. So he doesn't second guess what Ziba is saying. He looks at what he's brought. He's thankful. And he says, everything that I gave them a Mephibosheth, now you can have it. So David goes back on his word, but he really wasn't in a position to really make a decision like that. If you think about his emotional state, right? And there's things that we can learn from what's going on here in this particular verse, because David was really hurt by what Ziba had told him, and he made an emotional decision. And the first thing that we can learn from what's happening here between David and Ziba is that we should never make decisions based on our emotions, not when, when they are not in line with the word of God. We know that, right? I heard a lot of amens, right? Question, though, when the rubber meets the road and a lot of stuff is going on in your life that you dislike, do you make decisions based on the word of God? Uh, do you make decisions based on how you're feeling at that moment? We know the right answers, but I'm asking that you examine your life to examine your decision making. Do you fly off the handle if, if your spouse says something you don't like or that you don't agree with? What is the decision that you make in those situations? I, I, I pause a lot because I want you to think about it. Say la. Say la. I want you to really think about uh, what's being said and do a, an examination of your heart and where you really are concerning your decision making. If you're letting all questions that arise in your mind or all arguments that come up, if you're allow, allow, allowing your thoughts to align with the word of God or just what, what, you're, what, what you're feeling at the moment. Uh, I know with me and, and with everybody, feelings like an elevator. They take you up, they take you down. You don't know what floor they're going to, it's going to stop on, right? Right. But there is one way we can really learn how to handle our emotions because everything begins with the mind, right? Everything begins with a thought. Romans 12, and it's a familiar uh, scripture to us, says, and 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you, Paul is saying to this, therefore, brothers, also sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, conforming to the world means saying what you feel like you want to say, getting whatever you need to say off your chest, no matter how it affects other people. And but when we do that, when we allow our feelings to lead us, it negatively impacts relationships. It negatively impacts our marriage. It negatively impacts our friendships. It negatively impacts how we interact with one another in church. How many situations do you know of since you've been saved and seen things happen in church where you've seen people be casualties of people's emotional outbursts? God wants us to conform to his ways and not the world's ways. And if we have, we can be angry. It's not, it's not to say that we're not going to experience these feelings, but we got to put them in check. And we have to put them in check with the word of God. And the only way we can do that is if we know the word of God. So we have to make sure we spend time renewing our minds by reading the word of God. It's not how much you read, it's how much you apply. Sometimes we beat ourselves up about, oh man, I fell off track with my, I, my year plan. My year plan. 
But my question to you is the more, more thing you should be concerned about is are you living what you're reading? Are you living what you're reading? Because I can have a plan on my year and how that's supposed to go, but there's something that I have to sit and meditate on because that, whatever that is, I may be having some issues with that. Well, I, I'm telling myself, God, I need you to help me die to self so that how I respond in this situation is your way and not my own way because right now I'm teed off, peed off, however. Okay? Okay, but I want to do things God's way. I don't want to uh, respond in my emotions. The second point here is when we're looking at this situation is make sure you, when you listen to people talk that uh, in, in the situation involves other people, remember that there's more, one, more than one side to the story. The situation, Proverbs 18 and 17 says that the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him, meaning the first impressions aren't always accurate. It's not saying that they may not be wrong. It just might be missing some pieces. There can be more to a situation than we think, and we all see things differently. And what we need to, what we remember and recount, and how we interpret and translate events will vary from person to person. How many of y'all have been in a, a heated fellowship with a husband or a friend or whatever, and once they said one thing, you forgot the rest of everything they said? So when you talk to your friend about it, you didn't hear nothing else, but it, you, all you gave were what you heard at that time. But you not giving it, what you're saying is true, but it's not the complete picture. Right? Right. So you have to remember that. So this verse to, in Proverbs is simply teaching that we need to be careful and examine the situation before we reach a conclusion, because that's what David did. He reached a conclusion, and, and we'll find out later, a few chapters later, uh, what Mephibosheth had to say about this situation, about what Ziba was, was saying. But the thing is, even when we, if we hear one side of the story and listen to another side of the story, because I know, at least for me and some others, people come to us for counseling, and it involves two people. We're, we're not trying to see who's right. We want God to be right. And we want to make sure truth is given to both people so that they can re reconcile, right? And Proverbs 18, 13 also said, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame to him. It's, that's happened to me. My, my youngest son, my baby boy, he come to me, mom, my brother, blah, 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 blah. I done called both of them on the carpet and told them about how they shouldn't be doing certain things. And then I walk away and I hear my youngest son laughing in the back because he was just trying to get his brothers in trouble. I did not, even with my children, I did not take time to listen to my other sons with uh, Considering what my younger son had said, I just automatically believed him because he's the baby boy. Remember that when you're talking to your children. <laughs> it's two sides, so don't just, believe, don't just say, well, yeah, I know how my daughter is. She probably did that. No, that may not have been the situation. Uh, even when they're adults, make sure you hear both sides. And don't call the other child talking about what the other person said. Just say, hey, I just want y'all to reconcile. You know, whatever your differences are, I want you to love one another. But anyway, also, just people coming and talking to you. Sometimes people have good intentions and bad intentions. Some people, because somebody did something to them that they didn't like, they don't want you to like them either. I've had that happen. In church, I have. We all at different places, right? And so you have to remember that even when a person comes to you, it, it may not be. It may not be truth. My grandmother always said, "Consider the source." <laughs> but but you, but you know, you just want to make sure. At the end of the day, that that person is right with God. Not you're not siding. You should not side with anyone but the Lord. 
I've been embarrassed. I took someone's side, a girlfriend's side one time, and uh, was talking to the other person, and then the side was different, and then when it all came out, I just looked I had, like I had egg all over my face. Saints. Because they were hurt, they didn't, they, they, that's all they could betray to me, and that's all I could see, and they was a friend of mine. So we have to make sure we take away that tendency to want to side with the person that we're friends with. And also, too, when people are going through with their marriages, don't side with the husband or wife, side with God. If you know about them going through a divorce and that one person that you know really well is talking to you, don't, don't start looking at that spouse another way because you don't know the whole story. And counselors are, are, are good, Pastor Ty, over there, at, at, in understanding this, that you have to listen to both sides and you just trust God and you give God's truth. God's truth to them. Amen. All right. Verse five through eight says, when King David came to Bahurim, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually and he threw stones at David and all the servants of King David. I said, boy, he had some nerve. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said, as he cursed, get out, get out. You man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. Now, Shimei was a, he was a relative of Saul. And he was still salty for, you know, David taking over uh, kingship uh, from Saul. But he, you know, he was talking about kicking a person when they down. He really did. They're running, trying to get away, you know, because uh, Absalom might take their, send somebody to take their lives. And he's he going to throw, not just talking, he throwing rocks. He's throwing rocks. And, you know, he makes this accusation as far as what the Lord is doing to David. Yes, the Lord was involved, but it was not based on what he was saying. It was based on his own bitterness he was making a statement based on his own bitterness toward David taking over kingship. And we have to be careful because you know a little something by somebody that we don't say, yep, that thing, whatever they did, whatever sin that you know about. Now, that wasn't what happened with David here, but we have to be careful that we don't say, yep, that's, they made their bed, now they laying in it. They just reaping what they sow. You don't know what's going on. In there, you're on the outside, and you shouldn't be trying to look in. You should be just praying for the person. Because even when God uh, brings about some correction or some punishment, his goal is always to restore, not to make them feel worse. And neither should we do that, but that was what Shimmy was doing. There's some few lessons we can take from this, too. Not everybody's going to be happy about your success. We can see Shimmy, he wasn't happy about his success. You know, there's always going to be some people ready to rejoice when a leader or when a a believer falls. And Shimmy had his heart set against David for quite a long time. And he, at the opportune moment, he couldn't wait to open his mouth and say something and show David how he really felt when he was having a down moment. Now, as I said, David was not being punished for the reason Shimei was saying it was because of his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and murdering her husband. But this is a thing we need to keep in mind. Even if a leader does misstep some kind of way or does something wrong, we need to speak the truth to them, but we shouldn't be throwing rocks at them nor the people that support them. Because notice, Shimmy was throwing rocks at everybody. He was throwing them at David. He was throwing them at his family. He was throwing them at, at uh, even uh, his, his men that were with him. Because you have to remember, even when you look throughout the Bible, every biblical hero that we look up to had a flaw. They had some type of flaw, but God still used them. So God uses 
flawed people. He has a purpose for every believer despite their sin. And uh, I, I don't know if you recall, but if you remember in John 8 when the, we had these religious folks bring this adulterous woman out. And they were trying to bring him before Jesus based on something that was written in the law that you're supposed to stone a person that's committed adultery. But Jesus' statement was this. He who has no sin cast the first stone. Stone. Everybody had to leave. So when you see someone sin, whether it's a leader or another or a believer, whomever it is, don't throw rocks at them. You should lift them up in prayer. You should encourage them. We don't, we don't condone sin. We speak truth to sin, but we should encourage them and not speak negatively about them. When we speak negatively about our leaders, leaders we're throwing stone. When we speak negatively, negatively about our sisters and brothers, we're throwing stones. And none of us have the right to throw a stone at anybody because there is none righteous. Romans 3 and 10, if you need to go back and look at it. But this is how we should treat our leaders according to Hebrews 13 and 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Amen. Verse 9 through 14 says, then Abishai. The son of Zeruah said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Let me go over and take off his head. But the king said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruah, if he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this may this Benjamin Benjamin Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him and and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary at the Jordan and there he refreshed himself. So Abishai is like, I, I don't know why we're taking this off him. <laughs> That's pretty much what he said. Uh, I don't know why we do. You know, he throwing stones. He throwing up dust. He's speaking all this, speaking foul to us. And he was like, let's just go on and take him out. You know, but David said, just let him alone. Leave him alone. This time, David had his head on straight and making a decision. He said, just, just leave it alone. Who knows? Maybe this is happening to, to me. Maybe it, has, it's, maybe it has something even to do with the Lord, and maybe some good of it may come of it for me. When I thought about David's response, yes, there is kindness, but I thought had this in my mind. When we talk about our steps being ordered by the Lord, I've asked God to help me that, to have that sealed in my heart and mind because when things go left, I still want to have the mindset and the joy in my heart that even if this is happening and even if it's uncomfortable for me, I know that it had to pass through God's hands because some kind of way this is going to make me better. So I see that as the way God, uh, the way David had his mindset, he responded, and then he responded kind. And Luke 6, 28 tells us that we ought to bless those who curse us. Uh, Jesus tells us that the way that we respond to one who seeks to harm us is to pray. And we know that. But I ask you a question. Of the people have, that have done wrong to you, have you prayed for them? Or are you just ignoring them? Because the scripture didn't say ignore them. It said to pray for them and to do good, right? Because the Lord wants them to come to repentance too. So next time somebody does you wrong, you know, you don't, you ain't trying to hear what they have to say if it's negativity, but you go and pray for them too. Don't wait till later because you forget I'm guilty. I go ahead and pray for them right then, right? All right, all right. And also, I looked at it, I said, you need some loyal friends. Now, Abishai, he was ready to <laughs> cut Shimmy off, but you do need some friends around you that's going to support you. 
You know, you might have to hold them back if they're talking about taking off their earrings, uh, you know, whatever. If it's a dude, like, let's go get them, let's get it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might have to hold them back, but you need some people around you that's loyal to you that will, in your hard times, in your seasons, of uh, when it's hard for you, that they'll still be with you. You need some folks like Abishai. I'm not talking about the killing part. Only, only with them killing them with kindness. That, that's the only thing I'm saying. But you need some loyal people around you that even when you mess up, because we're going to mess up, they'll tell you the truth, but they ain't trying to bring you down. They're trying to build you up. And they just want, to, want you to walk in righteousness. When you done made a fool of yourself, when everybody know what you did, they still there for you. Because I don't know about y'all, but I did some stupid stuff. In the Air Force, praise God, I made it to 29 years, 10 months. But it was some stupid stuff I did. They can't give me for it now. <laughs> but it was some stupid stuff that I did, but I had some people around me that would encourage me to do the right thing and walk in righteousness. Okay? So... Surround yourself with some loyal friends, but make sure you be in that person. You know, uh, I didn't read the scripture because there's, I, let me give that to you real quick. Proverbs 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. But you got to make sure you, you want friends like that. You got to make sure you be that friend, too. You know, I, I had some folks that when I messed up, they said, oh, I knew she wasn't all that. She thinks she cute. You know how that. Whatever. I'm fearfully and wonderful, May. Yes. But yes, I screwed up, but I'm getting back on track. But anyway, so I, I had to learn who the loyal ones were. And a lot of times you find out who, who's loyal when something, you know, when you do something stupid, you know. All right, verse 15 through 19. Says, now Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. And when Hushai the Archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? He was talking about King David because he had been best friends with King David. Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom the Lord and, his, and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. And again, whom should I serve? Should it not be his son? As I have served your father, so I will serve you. Now, if you recall, in last chapter, Hushai wanted to go with David. But David, David said, I need an insider. <laughs> I need somebody to intercept some of the stuff that Absalom is doing and, and, and report that back to me. And, and so Hushai was on the inside, getting inside information and giving it to the priest, and the priest would give it to David because he also, if you recall, had told the priest to go back. But um, Hushai, uh, Hushai, he did, he did tell a lie. He concealed his motive. You know, because Absalom was like, I know how I know how great I know how faithful you was to David. Why are you here acting like you supporting me? But he he made a he did lie. He concealed his motive, and he was what I would call a serious spy, uh, being able to uh, hiding his motives in in that manner. Um, verse twenty through twenty three says, Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel. Because remember, Ahithophel was David's counselor, but now he's his son's counselor. He said, give your counsel. What shall we do? Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Low down. And all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench to your father and the hands of all who are with you and w will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now, in those days, the counsel that Ahithophel gave was as if one consulted the word of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel esteemed both by David and by Absalom. So Ahithophel, I don't know if you remember, but he was uh, Bathsheba's grandfather. 
And he was the one telling Absalom to do this offensive thing, to sleep with his father's concubines, who he left to take care of the palace. Because remember, he left, left them behind to take care of things. And he made a statement, then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself obnoxious to your father and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. We've heard this so many times. Hurt people hurt others. I talked to you earlier about Absalom, things that he was upset about, things that he did as far as uh, his father, uh, King David's negligence and um, how that impacted him. And then I, excuse me, I see Ahithophel, he's advising Absalom. And yes, this is a, a fulfillment of prophecy because in that 12th chapter, I believe, God said this was going to happen because of David's uh, sin. It's a consequence. God was going to let everything play out because of what David had done. And God told him this would happen. But so, so this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. But Ahithophel was advising Absalom from a place of hurt. Uh, when you're, you're in unforgiveness, it shows. It shows. It, it will imprison to you and uh, to your past. All your eye actions, you'll be dry. It's like you're looking through the lens of the past, making decisions for the future. That's what Ahithophel was doing. It, he was keeping, he obviously had kept the pain alive, as well as Absalom, keeping the pain alive. I remember when I was going through a divorce and just certain things I would say. And my pastor just said to me one day, he said, you cannot heal from what you constantly rehearse. And when he said that, it resonated so with me. And when I stopped talking about that thing and focusing on that thing, I wasn't as irritated. I was at peace instead of thinking about all the things that were happening, all the things that were being said about me, all the lies that were being talked about, all the people that have forsaken me who I said they must have never been my friends to think I would be that type of person. But when you have that type of hurt, it causes you to be bitter and it would drive so many of your decisions in the wrong direction, it's like an infection. It just infects every part of you. It infects your whole life. And it just really trace, it just traces back to uh, unwillingness to forgive some, somebody. Now, I know people that things that have happened in their life, their parents, that somebody or a relative knew about it, but they didn't say nothing about it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some things that a cousin did or an uncle did to this person and no one did or anything about it. And then that child grows up and they're an adult and they still have not forgiven because somebody didn't speak up for them. I can imagine that's how Absalom felt. I'm talking about how he's operating. We see how terrible he was operating. But all the things that he saw that weaved in where he was, that unforgiveness was there. The raping of his sister. No one doing anything about it. So he took matters because he let it fester in his own hands and murdered his brother. Because he hadn't really got a relationship back with his father, letting it fester and fester. He sought to take everything from him. That's what unforgiveness will do. It will try to take over you. It will try to rule you. Tonight, we've been looking at the life of David. We talked about several things. Holy Spirit revealed to us that we don't need to make any decisions when we're on an emotional roller coaster, we need to get somewhere and quiet ourselves, meditate in the Word of God before we respond in any situation. We also learned that when people are talking to us, sometimes they say it's just, I just need to talk to somebody. Sometimes it's just gossip. We just have to say, you know, see it for what it is, that we have to make sure that we realize that when people are talking to us, they're only giving 
It's only one part of the story. And even if we know one or even both parts of the story, our job is not to see who's right, but to reveal the God of truth who's right and righteous in those situations. We also learned just now from the latter half that we got to make sure that when things happen in our lives, and I don't know if something has happened in someone's life and here that's happened from childhood, that they still haven't forgiven one of their relatives for that. But we got to make sure we let it go because it will show up in every situation. You might be taking it out on a, in a relationship with your husband or your wife. You could just be uh, not able to establish friendships because you haven't let go of some bitterness or some unforgiveness of something that happened to you years ago. The greatest forgiver, the greatest example is our God, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus that we would have eternal life. He demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He said, you're worth it if you receive what I did for you. I forgive you. And you can walk in that same forgiveness that I've given you. Everybody bow your heads, please. Father God, thank you for your word on tonight. Thank you, Father God, for teaching us what friendships looks like, what loyalty looks like. Thank you for teaching us not to be rash with our decisions. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us that the way to control our emotions is to renew our mind and your word, God, so that when things happen in our life, our base, our foundation is your word and that we allow your word to rule in everything that happens in our lives. I pray, Father God, for every person in this room, if they have some unforgiveness toward an individual, that, Father, that they, they would forgive them. If they're holding something, Lord God, that they go back and they, the other person knows it and they've had bitterness for years and never been able to talk, I pray, Lord God, that you give them the courage to pick up the phone and call that person and tell them, what happened, it hurt me, but I forgive you because God has forgiven me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give God a hand, praise. And I'm going to ask that you bow your heads one more time. I mentioned earlier that not, there is none righteous as far as people. There's only one righteous, and that righteous one is God. Our righteousness to God is as filthy rags. We're all sinners, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I mentioned earlier that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son Jesus to die for our sin just so he could have relationship with us so that we could live eternally with him, so that he could be in our lives every day. If you have not believed on the name of Jesus, there's only one thing, only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. If you have not believed in Jesus and you want to receive his love and forgiveness on tonight, I ask that you raise your hand, whether you're online or whether you're in this room. I ask that you repeat after me, Father God, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for your sin, to die for my sin. God, I repent of my sin. I confess Jesus as my Lord. I believe that you raised him from the dead, that he's with you, and that because I believe in Jesus, I'm eternally with you. Give me your Holy Spirit so that I can live a life pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on and give the Lord a hand. Praise for increasing his kingdom. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all you taught us on tonight.
Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. At this time, it is giving time. God is always, he's always given to us. He's already given us the greatest through his son, Jesus Christ. And now we're asking that if you desire to be, if you want to be a cheerful giver, that you give on tonight of your finances. There are several ways you can give. You can look here on the screen through Cash App, Zelle. You can text the amount. You can also mail it in. And also, if you desire, you can put it in an envelope that's right behind the chairs and hand it to one of the ushers before you leave. As you're giving, I'm praying. Father God, thank you for every person in this room and online that's listening. I pray, Father God, that you bless what they've given on tonight. First of all, they've given of their time for every thing that they have received on tonight, the word that they've received, I pray, God, that they're productive in every area of, the, of their life. I also pray, Lord God, for their finances, that they have increased from the north, south, east, and west in their bank accounts, that they have supernatural debt cancellation, and that they're good stewards of what you've given them. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for giving and thank you for your time being here. Now for our announcements, if you'll look on the screen, several announcements will come up. We have uh, life classes that are beginning, uh, stepping up. Uh, we have for our men that is occurring on every Saturday at 7, 7 in the morning. And uh, my husband has been enjoying it. So I'm asking that y'all come out and enjoy, <laughs> and enjoy it with my husband. Uh, he... I tell you, I love my husband. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but um, he's really enjoying that class. It's just teaching him so much about manhood and uh, who he is supposed to be as a man and also as a husband, a father, just all the way around. So please come out to that. You will truly be blessed. You'll be a better husband, father, friend, everything. Isn't that right, Pastor Ty? <laughs> Amen. We also have uh, Adopt a Highway that's occurring on May 4th, uh, where we go out and we pick up any garbage that's occurring. Uh, Saturday, May 4th, and Saturday, September 7th. And okay, I didn't say all of them. Okay, the first one I need to talk, talk about is September 7th, and we'll get rid of the May, because that's already happened. And then the next one, December 7th, we're just putting more out there so you can plan ahead if you want to be a part of it. Also, we have our uh, other life class uh, courses that are happening. You can go online and look and see what they are at lfcc.tv. But we also have our boys to men, a guide to a life of godly living. I know my husband wish he, for what he's learning in men stepping up, he wish he would have had that as a young boy. Um, so for those of you who have sons uh, 14 to 18 years of age, please bring them out to that event on September 14, 2024. Okay. All right. What else? We have a lot of different things happening. Bites and Insights with the crew, uh, September 15th after the third uh, service. You can learn about how to create some hangouts. Uh, I'm guilty. I have not done it yet, so I will. I will, Pastor Ty. <laughs> I will get on that crew app. We also have, uh, we uh, make sure we reach out to the community. Uh, we need some items for some uh, girls. We want to, they need, uh, you see it all there on the screen. They need some feminine hygiene products, intimate cleaning wipes and chapstick, travel size deodorant. Ladies, we know all about that. So when you're out and you're shopping about, please pick up something extra for one of the ladies. Uh, they will surely pre appreciate it. And the last thing, uh, food pantry. We have bags available after this service. We also have uh, bags available after the Sunday services. Um, and with that being said, please stand. I'm going to pray for the food and we will uh, recite our verse. Father God, thank you for the food that's been prepared. Uh, let it be nourishment for our bodies as we go about doing your will in the name of Jesus. And let's recite uh, our verse. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you need prayer, ministers will be here at the front. Go with God, be fruitful, and everything that you learn here on tonight, in Jesus' name. <laughs>